On va commencer euh, par euh, le CubeSat euh, de Paris d'Hydro qui s'appelle IgoSat. Donc allons-y. So good morning everybody. We are students from uh, the project IgoSat and we're here today to present you our satellite. In this presentation, we will begin by presentation of the IGOSAT project. After that, we will present our two payloads, the Sentiator and the GPS, and we will finish by presentation of our ground station. So IGOSAT is a project uh, of satellite, of nanosatellite made by students uh, of LabEx Universe Earth. It's founded by LabEx Universe Earth and Janus, and it's part of Janus program. Our satellite is satellite three units, and uh, it aims to study ionospheric and gamma rays observations in the uh, magnetosphere also. Our satellite, our project uh, began in uh, 2012, and we are actually in phase C. So it is a phase where we are making a detailed conception of all subsystems and each part of the project. And uh, we are preparing for entrance to phase D, uh, by presenting the CDR in September. Okay, our satellite uh, has plenty of uh, subsystems. The functional subsystems, uh, like the telecommunication subsystems, which allow us to communicate with our satellite using uh, amateur radio. Uh, our EPS electric uh, power which uh, provide our satellite and all subsystems uh, on energy using solar panels and batteries for saving energy. The structure, which uh, is responsible for all deployable component like the antenna and our deployable solar panels. The ADCS, which uh, is responsible for controlling the attitude of the satellite, its orientation for making it uh, doing well its missions and our two payloads, the Sentiator and the GPS, and we will talk about them uh, much more later. And of course, the onboard computer, which is uh, responsible for all monitoring operation and all command on board the satellite. And now we will pass to our payload. Hello everyone, I'm going to be presenting the scintillator payload. We'll start off, uh, it's going to be a short presentation, not very detailed, but uh, hopefully there are questions. And uh, we'll start off with the scientific objectives and then continue on to the general architecture, how it's going to be functioning. So what we're trying to do is basically measure the radiation spectrum in low Earth orbit for gamma rays and electrons, for gamma rays between 20 keV and 2 MeV in energy, and for electrons between 1 MeV and 20 MeV. And uh, in the upper left corner, we can see uh, a distribution of trapped electrons in low Earth orbit at 650 kilometers. And as we can clearly see, there are three zones that are most interesting uh, for, uh, to, uh, to measure because the difference in, uh, in content of electrons between uh, the red zones and the blue zones is uh, six orders of magnitude. And we have, um, we have uh, the auroral zones uh, that we're interested in and the South Atlantic anomaly. Now. Uh, the this distribution of electrons is due to the particular shape that the magnetosphere of the Earth has. We all know that uh, the magnetic uh, axis of uh, the Earth does not coincide with uh, the rotational axis, which means that uh, the magnetosphere is going to be shifted, uh, is going to be offset by the same offset that the magnetic axis is. So what we have here is basically zones in the, the auroral zones where particles can uh, easily penetrate uh, lower into the atmosphere. So uh, it's really interesting to study this. And also because the axis is offset, the inner radiation belt is a lot closer to the Earth um, in uh, the South Atl Atlantic anomaly. And the interest uh, of measuring this, uh, the energy of these particles is basically, this is uh, very important data for future missions in the lower orbit because uh, it provides a lot of information for uh, shielding and uh, how, how exactly the mission is going to be planned. And, uh, uh, we can also uh, will be able to, uh, to have uh, a lot of data after a year of uh, measurements and this will hopefully uh, let us study the correlation between external events and the, uh, part the particles present in the radiation belts. So if there are, we'll maybe be able to study the coupling between the solar winds and the magnetosphere and other uh, phenomena. I'll continue on with uh, 
a brief description of uh, the payload and uh, how it's going to be functioning. Basically, we have um, we have two scintillating materials in uh, in our payload, which is uh, cerium bromide, which is sensible to electrons and gamma rays, and a plastic uh, scintillator, an EG200, which is sensible only to electrons. And we'll be able to uh, discern between the two types of particle by uh, achieving detection in coincidence, in coincidence or anti-coincidence. As we see in the upper left corner, when an electron passes through the detector, it's going to... Uh, it's going to create light in uh, the two types of uh, material, of scintillation materials, and if it's a uh, gamma ray, it's going to create scintillation only in the crystal. So, uh, in order to read this uh, light and to quantify the energy deposed in the scintillator, we're, we're going to be using uh, silicon, uh, silicon photomultipliers. Now, uh, this, is a, this is a new technology, it's, uh, well, relatively new. It's never been yet used in space, so it'll let us kind of, it'll let us see the functioning of this type of technology in space, because till now all the silicon photomultipliers used were used in uh, ground-based uh, experiments. And uh, after, uh, after uh, we'll, we'll be treating the silicon photomultiplier output with, um, uh, with a EasyRock chip. It's an application-specific integrated chip. And it's also been used only on the ground, so this will let us uh, see the performance in space for maybe future missions. And this, uh, the EasyRock board has been designed uh, by, uh, by the IGOSAT project. And uh, basically we're going to be amplifying and shaping our signals uh, and then analyzing them with um, an X-Mega microcontroller, which uh, we can't really see on the board because it's on the other side. And uh, after a couple of data, uh, data analysis, uh, we'll be able to uh, transmit the spectrum uh, that we calculated to the onboard computer to be sent uh, down to Earth. So we'll continue now with uh, the GPS payload. And uh, hopefully, if there are any questions, we're uh, ready to answer at the end of the presentation. OK, so hello. Um, GPS payload will be a short presentation. Of course, the payload will provide to Igosat the position and time from a GPS satellites, but more of that, it will be a scientific payload, and for that, we will use uh, an antenna and a receiver, uh, both dual frequency. What we want to study is the ionosphere, and uh, we will study the number of electrons into the ionosphere. Here, uh, you can see a map of the number of electrons uh, during the day, and we see the coupling between the solar radiation and the ionosphere, and we can follow the sun around the Earth. But this map is uh, based on ground station, so there is a lack of data uh, above the ocean, and we want to study it uh, in more details. So we'll use the fact that uh, the ionosphere is a dispersive medium for radio waves and that the number of electrons provoke uh, ionospheric delay in uh, both L1 and L2 signals sent by uh, GPS satellites. So on IGOSAT, we use a GPS antenna and a GPS card. Uh, they are commercial as on the shelf. And uh, they are both dual frequency. They will be linked to a GPS software on the onboard computer, um, and then the data will be sent to the ground station. Those data uh, will be the pseudo range, the query phase, and the signal to noise ratio from L1 and L2. And to acquire those data, we'll do a radio occultation mission. So we will uh, probe each layer of the ionosphere from the top to the loss of the signal. And with those data, we can have uh, on the bottom left a take time series. So it's the number of electrons integrated between uh, our two satellites. And then we will inverse this, pro this data to have an electron density profile. Here, you can see um, some data uh, we have with uh, cosmic data. We use our algorithm to have this. And we study the ionosphere during an event called an high-speed solar wind stream uh, that perturbs the ionosphere and provoke delay into a communication uh, between, uh, for example, satellites and uh, the Earth. So we can detect some uh, changes between uh, those events in the ionosphere 
and some event and uh, some nominal period uh, on the right back. But there is also a second mission to the GPS payload. It's GPS signal scintillation. We will study the irregularities in the signal through the ionosphere. And we will do this with uh, two in this, uh, intensity irregularities in the signal, S4, and in irregularities in the phase, sigma phi, uh, in L1 and L2. Uh, not sorry, just in L1 for this one. And, uh, we want to correlate it with the scintillator payload, so we'll study the same areas. Okay, so now we can pass to the ground station. So the ground station is uh, the part of the project which allows us to command satellite from Earth. The communication we can have with satellite are of two types, uplink and downlink communication. For the uplink, we can send to the satellite its configuration panel. It's a list of parameters the satellite needs to, uh, to, to run its payload and other subsystems. For example, we can send to it uh, the maximum temperature of component to, uh, to follow the monitoring of all component, or maybe the frequency of a take mode for a payload, or all the parameters it needs for running. We can also send telecommand in a routine. Uh, we can send a list of telecommand it has to execute. For example, activation of event mode uh, in that duration, or maybe uh, asking satellite to send us uh, the latest housekeeping uh, telemetries, etc. And for uh, the telemetries the satellite sends to us, we have two kinds of telemetries. The housekeeping telemetries, which inform us of the state of the satellite, for example, having a log of all the command uh, who was being executed or all the errors happened in the satellite and also uh, the telemetries of all the components like a voltage of components, temperature of components, etc. And finally, the payload telemetries, which are the heart of our telemetries uh, and the scientist telemetries we need. For example, uh, particle energy spectrum from the sensator or other telemetries from the GPS. So for receiving these telemetries and sending this, uh, this command, we actually have two ground stations, one in Paris, from where we can send telecommand and receive telemetries, another in Hanoi, from where we can receive only telemetries, and we are expecting to have one in Peru, and uh, like that, we can have our satellite invisibility much more often. Now, for the software of the ground station, or the command control software, we have three parts of, uh, of this software. The first part is the mission, mission center. The mission center is a center where scientists can put uh, the mission plan, and put all the tasks the satellite has to, to make. And uh, after that, this mission plan will be uh, give us a routine. This routine will be written in the command control center by an operator. And the routine, it's more explicit. It has all the telecommand, all the detailed telecommand we will send to the, to the satellite. Uh, both scientists and operator can generate the configuration panel, put in the parameter they need. And after that, we will receive from the satellite, as we said, the PLTM, the payload TM, uh, which will be analyzed and treated by scientists in the mission center, and also housekeeping TM, which will be followed by the operator in command control center. And there are some operations which are automatic, like a historization of all operations. We will take, um, we will save a history of all operations, sending command, all version of the configuration panel, all the telemetries we receive, and also encoding and decoding data. We have to encode uh, data for sending them to the satellite and decode the telemetries he sent to us. For that, we use for our software a language Java with MySQL for the database. And for the security of our data, we will assure that by three points. The first one is centralization of database. We will have just one database for all the ground stations, and it will assure the uniqueness of the information and not having different version, which can be, the, which can be a, a problem for us. The redundancy of data, it means that we will save data in all its format. For example, for the telemetries, we will save the telemetries as uh, like we receive them, and after decoding them, and uh, etc. So we will save the, the information in all its format and 
in in all its format and uh, in all uh, and in all point of the process of uh, encoding and decoding them and also we will uh, secure the connection to the database by using uh, an ssh connection to the database so thank you for your listening and we will let you with this uh, short video of igosat Thank you for this uh, very great presentation, very clear. And if, we, if you have any questions now. Um. Uh, I, I, it's a, maybe a stupid question. Uh, why do you have a GPS antenna just on one face of the satellite? Because uh, I guess you would uh, not see all uh, eclipse events of uh, GPS satellites. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a specification of the mission that we only have uh, one antenna. And as you can see here, we can have uh, at least five uh, GPS satellites in, uh, in view in all time. So uh, with the data we can send to Earth, it's a lot of uh, data. So we can have uh, what we want with only one antenna. Observe, maybe. Yeah, and also just to, to make a precision, I mean, for the occultation, you need to have the antenna pointing as the opposite of the velocity vector for the occultation uh, value. So actually, in the simulation, the satellite is spinning. But uh, if it, OK, if you assume that first order, it's not spinning, it will, be, it will have the antenna, GPS antenna for science pointing at the opposite of the velocity vector. That's the only position where we can have occultation data. No question. Just wanted to congratulate you on the quality of the slides. It's quite uh, nice to have a good quality slides uh, once in a while. Any questions? So, but thank you very much. I guess we are moving on a, a presentation of the CSU of Grenoble. I guess, no? Yes? Hello, um, I'm going to present the Space Center of uh, University of Grenoble. Um, our summary today, uh, I'm going to, to present uh, the, the ecosystem of the, the space activities around Grenoble, uh, the educational part, how we, we saw uh, um, this part, and uh, and uh, finally, our scientific missions and the uh, two satellites, ATIS and AmicalSat, and in conclusion. <coughs> Grenoble is a quite small city, but uh, we have uh, uh, many companies uh, who are working uh, uh, around space. Uh, I give some example. Uh, some of them are very well known, uh, like uh, Air Liquid uh, working of uh, uh, for uh, Ariane Space, uh, for tanks, for example, or uh, cooling. <coughs> uh, some of them, uh, U2V, uh, make uh, uh, sensor from, and, uh, and we've got uh, also uh, some uh, 
some laboratories um, in CNRI, CEA, and the uh, university, of course. Uh, in Grenoble, we've got uh, in laboratories uh, some uh, heritage uh, from uh, different missions. Uh, I can uh, mention uh, uh, quickly uh, in, in uh, IPAG, uh, uh, who works on Rosetta uh, for the instrument concert, LPSC uh, on, the, on the mission AMS. Uh, Institutionnel works on Planck. And, uh, and uh, in the CAA LIT, uh, have you seen uh, the model uh, in, the, in, the, in the coffee uh, room? And uh, in CAA E2, uh, uh, air shell, the coolers. The university, we've got two universities um, with uh, 80 laboratories in the UGA, Université Grenoble Alpes and uh, Grenoble ENP, 36 laboratories. All of them are around 50,000 uh, 50, uh, students uh, for a city which is uh, uh, less than 400,000 uh, habitants. This is a, a big percentage. And why we, we make a space center in this place? Uh, in fact, uh, there is a large concentration of uh, education and research and corporations uh, working in space with a good cooperation for, for more than 60, 60 years. <coughs> and there were uh, no formation in space methodology specifically and uh, a not very good area because we are no, no prime uh, in, uh, in companies and laboratories uh, around space. We created uh, then the, the seizing on this uh, ecosystem in uh, September uh, 2050. Uh, how we work with students? Uh, we are uh, using and uh, teaching uh, 120 students by year. Uh, they are coming from all university, all, uh, all spe specialities on all level from uh, DUT to, uh, to engineer and masters, and, and uh, we are just uh, uh, um, give them uh, some uh, add-on courses and experiences. Uh, as you can see uh, in the pictures, uh, we've got uh, uh, workers from, company, from uh, different companies. We help them, uh, uh, which uh, making courses on uh, thermal data or uh, harness uh, electronics. And, uh, and uh, all students are in trainship or in their uh, module, uh, module teaching uh, experience. And, um, and they are including completely to the CISUC team. Like we are not, we are a quite small uh, team with uh, about uh, t 10 people uh, quite permanent and uh, teachers and, uh, and uh, all students are working with them in the, in the, same, uh, in the same way and uh, no, uh, no hierarchy level uh, especially for students. About scientific missions, uh, the two missions that, that I uh, present today uh, are around uh, Aurora, so I, uh, I will explain uh, very simply uh, way uh, the aurora phenomenon. Well, in fact, it's, it, this is the expression of the solar activity. Uh, this is why uh, we are observing auroras. Uh, particles are coming from uh, solar and uh, are, are, are getting uh, in the, the, the magnetosphere of the, the Earth and uh, precipitate on the top and, uh, on the, the poles and um, interact with the uh, ionosphere and emit emits photons uh, that their long waves and the uh, intensity uh, are, uh, are um, uh, characteristic from the particles are coming from sun. 
Okay, with short, just to, to explain the, uh, the, mission, the, the goals of the mission. Uh, so we made uh, for that, uh, for the, the ATIS mission, uh, a spectrometer will, uh, which analyzes uh, the, the spectrum and the, of the language and the, the intensity. Uh, and uh, we want to monitor it uh, from the space uh, to have the um, the 3D dissipation of the, the particles. We, we have the, in ATIS mission, two instruments. The first one is the spectrometer. The second one is the high sensibility camera that we made uh, by, by themselves because we didn't find uh, such uh, good enough, uh, such sensible enough uh, on, the, on the shelf. We make an onboard treatment uh, this is a Fourier transform, and uh, we need a specific orbit, like uh, you can see in the picture in the center. Uh, the auroras are not uh, symmetric, so it will be interesting, interesting to shift in the uh, local hour uh, to monitor all the, the auroras. Uh, in this project, we are, we are making the payload. And the platform is made uh, we, uh, we, by the CESUT in collaboration. We made all the satellites. And it is very interesting because we had uh, to learn to be an interface. It is another center. And the presentation, the presentation uh, after will be uh, uh, send, uh, send more information about it. Um, we are on this project. 50 students, more than 50 students, and 10, 10 teachers about. We've made the tested demonstration model. This is the picture on the, the bottom right. Uh, we tested uh, on the uh, aurora lights, uh, which are very, um, very low level and, uh, and quite specific. Uh, this, this spectrometer is uh, uh, possible uh, with the uh, spot sensor. Uh, this is a spectrometer, a miniaturized spectrometer, spectrometers um, on a fizzle, uh, uh, fizzle, ef uh, fizzle effect. I'm, no I'm not specialist on this, part, this particle especially. And we need uh, three detectors we implemented uh, on, the, on the model. Uh, as we can see, uh, there is an uh, entry lens, some mirrors, because we need to, uh, to, to be in a CubeSat, so we have to, to bend uh, the, the light uh, to be more compact. And uh, the captor, the sensor, uh, uh, collects the, 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 the light, then at the end of the telescope. Uh, we, you can see also the imager in the center, almost the center of the, of the, of the instrument. The, the imager is, is here for uh, uh, completing the spectrometer information uh, and do, to see where we are in the aurora, in the, which altitude, and, uh, uh, and the, to, to validate information from the spectrometer. Uh, the Amical Sat mission. This is a, a mission uh, on the same uh, phenomenon. Uh, in fact, uh, we took the imager out from uh, from uh, Atis mission and to make an, an, a smaller satellite. Uh, this uh, this is a quite beginning uh, project. Um, the, it will be a 2U uh, satellite. And uh, we need uh, we need uh, to to increase the CESU uh, uh, process manu uh, uh, manufacturing for satellites. So we, we we decided to make a simple a simple uh, satellite uh, to uh, to progress and uh, and interact with all phases before uh, have to do that uh, with that is which is more complicated. So we hope we are uh, developing, developing the payload and the platform is by on the shelf. We are going to make uh, integration uh, software uh, complement and uh, all, um, 
all tests and, uh, and, uh, and maybe we hope launch uh, at the end of uh, 2080. Uh, this is uh, op quite optimist, but we have the, uh, we would like to, to, to go on the Vega uh, product concept. And this is why the, the, the schedule is quite, uh, quite, quite difficult. And uh, now we, we, uh, we did the phase A of this project for the payload and phase zero because we didn't choose yet the platform. Phase zero for the platform, sorry. <coughs> Simultaneous, we are going to developing a uh, ground station. We, we began uh, to make a UHF VHF station first and uh, maybe a uh, S-band if uh, needed for other satellites uh, uh, like, uh, like Amical, uh, which is not uh, choose uh, yet. Uh, the S-band uh, will be developed, developed uh, with a, a company, uh, General Electric, uh, we are, which wants to uh, work with them and to help them in this, uh, in this way. In the Amical mission, we uh, choose uh, the same imager of uh, ATIS that uh, I didn't present yet. Uh, this is a sensor from uh, U2E2V. Uh, this is the Onyx. Uh, we choose it at first because it, it got uh, a very big pixels, uh, 10 uh, micrometers, uh, because we have uh, to, to have a long exposure uh, from uh, around one second. So we need uh, to don't have too much blur and need a big pixel for it. Uh, we choose it uh, for uh, the sensibility and quantum efficacy to uh, And the lens will be by, uh, this is a Schneider uh, Xenon with a 0 095 uh, focal. Uh, very open uh, lens. <coughs> Uh, it has been yet uh, uh, flight, and uh, maybe we need a, a, some preparation, but we had to, to check it in phase A. In phase a. Uh, we developed uh, also the, the, the card uh, for the sensor. Uh, it is almost, uh, we, we got a prototype uh, very near of, uh, in a few, few weeks. Our difficulties, uh, like every, everybody, I think, for a space center in university, uh, the human resource, but uh, at uh, diff different levels. Uh, permanent are not uh, so much, of course. And uh, the teachers and machine is a uh, great, uh, great trouble. Uh, yeah. uh, the teachers and machine uh, is, is it's a great trouble uh, to, to fix uh, teachers from one year to another year and follow the, the whole project. Uh, maybe if you have uh, uh, ideas for it, uh, it could, could be interesting to discuss. Uh, of course, funding for learning uh, is a trouble for us too. And uh, the positive point, of course, I just uh, put three, but um, certainly more. Uh, the, the students are really integrated to, uh, to working team, and that's very nice uh, to work in that case. Uh, it, for instance, uh, we've got an excellent uh, integration in the industry. Uh, after one training, uh, training friendship uh, by uh, the CESUG, um, uh, the, the students are really going uh, on uh, space center, space uh, companies or uh, other um, exigent uh, industry. And we are, uh, by this way, discover all the space chain uh, uh, because we are making small satellites uh, with, uh, we can uh, access to all these parts. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thierry. Have you any questions?
I have one. Yeah. Are you sure, sure for your amical CubeSat that uh, to you is uh, is good? Is uh, because uh, you have an optical system. What? You need uh, an ADCS, uh, maybe uh, instance, a little bit complicated. Uh, I think it will be uh, it will be uh, good enough. We will see uh, after, we will see after the uh, fin, during the. The, the tender, but um, uh, our payload is very small. Uh, the, the objective, the lens uh, we choose, uh, is not so, so 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 big. The sensor is is quite uh, small. I think uh, we will need uh, only uh, un less than 100 millimeters by uh, 40 millimeters or 50 millimeters uh, uh, for the payload. I, after the pointing um, is not very accuracy uh, because, uh, in fact, uh, the, the main difficulty is, is that we didn't know, we don't know exactly where is the the rise. So we have to to make uh, a success of picture, <coughs> uh, but um, we don't know if the rise will be exactly here. Then, but you need a stability. But, uh, no, but no you. You said uh, you need the stability to, to take pictures? Yeah, uh, for the blur, yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe it's, it's not, a, not an advantage point. Uh, but uh, we try to, to access to good al algorithm to, to have uh, uh, no much blur and uh, we maximize the, the pixel size for that. Okay, thank you. Another question. Uh, I have a similar question. In fact, uh, about the two, uh, two, two units, uh, do you think that you have to have deployable solar panels uh, to uh, deployable solar panels, or you can get away with? Uh, no, the, the solar panels are all, all around uh, the two uh, satellites. There are no deployable uh, uh, needed. Uh, in fact, we can. Um, Ah, you might know that. <laughs> we, we, we can uh, just uh, pointing uh, and uh, the satellite will, will be uh, horizontally and, uh, and access to sun like that. On Big, two face, uh, maximum. And uh, maximum of two face. Well, basically, uh, my question is uh, in line with uh, Alain Gaboyo was saying, but not more in terms of the volume that you have, but rather power budget. Because to you means that... Uh, a bit, it's, it's um, not so easy. And it's exceptionally, uh, ex uh, especially when you don't have deployable solar panels. Well, power, power budget, uh, the, the payload is not a uh, uh, good, um, uh, very consumative. Um, we hope the, the, the platform won't be. Well, that's why we have to, 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 to go in phase A for yeah. platform too. And, um, and for us, the, the big trouble is the, the quantity of data. Oh. Because we, are, we want to make many pictures and, uh, and put it back uh, on the ground. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Another question? You've chosen. Uh a position already for the ground station because given the fact that there is a lot of mountains around, putting, uh, putting it in Grenoble would really reduce the visibility, so I was wondering if it's going to be somewhere else or not. Mm. Well, uh, in fact, yes, uh, this is not um, uh, the, the best point to, to, have, uh, to have access to space, uh, in, but uh, we've got only 15 degrees uh, Dead for for the because of the mountains, uh, but it's necessary to have uh, the the station not so far from us uh, to to learn to work with it. But uh, it will be very really interesting to to have collaboration to have uh, other uh, station in, uh, in uh, not uh, in Europe, uh, for instance. Uh, 
and for us uh, it is it could be interesting to to be uh, far from uh, from north and south uh, because we are uh, making measurements uh, in this satellite uh, on the horizon okay thank you so now we are moving on the presentation of the CSU Toulouse. Toulouse. Okay, good morning. Uh, firstly, I want to apologize to foreign uh, colleague because uh, I will talk more about management than uh, uh, scientist aspect, so I prefer to make my talk in French. Uh, but you feel free to uh, ask me some questions after. Donc, je me présente Nicolas Nollier, je suis professeur à l'Université Paul Sabatier de Toulouse en électronique et euh, chercheur euh, au la CNRS. Et donc, je vais vous présenter euh, le Centre spatial universitaire de Toulouse. Alors, euh, je parlais déjà au niveau de sa structure. C'est un groupe d'intérêt scientifique, on appelle ça un GIS dans le jargon du CNRS, qui a été créé en 2016, en juin 2016, et qui regroupe en fait euh, des écoles d'ingénieurs telles que l'ISAE, Superhero, euh, l'INSA de Toulouse, l'INP, l'Institut National Polytechnique de Toulouse, euh, l'université et ses IUT. Euh, le CNRS à travers euh, trois laboratoires, le LAS, l'IRAP et le CESBIO. Et euh, j'ai oublié, excusez-moi, l'École nationale de la science civile euh, et l'organisme tel que l'ONERA. On a le soutien euh, de notre voisin euh, qui est le CNES. Alors l'objectif euh, du CSUT, bien sûr, c'est de développer une connaissance mutualisée en fait, des activités sur euh, les nanosystèmes spatiaux. Vous avez vu qu'on est plusieurs, plusieurs écoles, universités, essayer d'un petit peu mutualiser et coordonner tout ça, au lieu d'aller travailler tous un petit peu chacun de notre côté. Euh, d'assurer une visibilité au niveau national et international de Toulouse euh, sur ce sujet-là, euh, d'essayer en local de promouvoir l'usage des nanosystèmes, notamment avec euh, nos collègues chercheurs, euh, de coordonner des moyens de test ou des méthodes euh, de développement, et euh, bien sûr euh, s'ouvrir et proposer des collaborations avec euh, les autres CSU. Euh, donc le CSUT se retrouve donc au milieu de, de ces trois entités que sont formation, laboratoire et industrie. On essaye un petit peu de motiver et, et renforcer les liens entre, entre ces parties. Qu'est-ce qu'on peut en tirer au niveau euh, des formations Mais Déjà euh, de stimuler un petit peu l'excellence de ces formations par rapport à, euh, au spatial, euh, à travers les projets, hein, motiver les étudiants. Motiver les étudiants aussi à travailler ensemble et à, en fait développer euh, des projets communs entre les écoles ou l'université, et on se rend compte qu'en fait ils ne se connaissent pas trop, et à travers les projets, bien, ils arrivent à bien dialoguer et, et bien amener chacun leur, leur pierre à l'édifice. Bon, euh, travailler sur les nanosats, c'est une carte de visite aussi, hein, donc euh, favoriser bien sûr l'insertion professionnelle de nos étudiants, euh, et via des coopérations, euh, faire rayonner en fait nos formations. Par rapport au laboratoire, bien, c'est continuer... Euh, à renforcer en fait la, le lien qu'il peut y avoir entre la formation et la recherche et euh, proposer euh, sur la partie recherche euh, à, à avoir un, ou essayer de leur proposer une plateforme technologique qui leur permet de, de, de tester euh, une, un matériau, un composant, ainsi de suite. Et avec l'industrie, bien, renforcer bien sûr le lien formation-industrie euh, proposer à travers euh, les projets ou à travers nos étudiants un vivier de stagiaires hein, que ces industriels peuvent, peuvent appeler et favoriser euh, l'émergence de start-up. Alors l'organisation du CSUT, il y a un noyau dur en fait euh, composé de la direction et avec une, une équipe d'ingénierie. Alors euh, c'est une équipe, autant la direction... Euh, euh, à un âge assez avancé, autant l'équipe d'ingénierie est relativement jeune. Donc on se retrouve avec, euh, avec des personnes comme Antoine, Fabien, Nicolas ou encore Thierry, qui ne sont euh, en fait euh, pas membres du CSUT en tant que euh, payés par le CSUT, mais de par la structure en fait, euh, 
qui, sont, euh, qui alimentent en fait, qui sont alimentés par euh, les structures partenaires. Pour gérer ce, ce système, donc en fait, on a trois comités. Un comité directeur qui se réunit une fois par an. En gros, ce sont euh, les représentants des établissements, les, les directeurs. Euh, un comité scientifique qui s'ouvre beaucoup plus, avec des gens sur l'extérieur. On a des gens, euh, de, une personne de l'ESA, une personne du CSU de Grenoble. On a euh, une personne d'Airbus euh, sur Toulouse, bon, le CNES, ainsi de suite. Et le comité de pilotage, où ce sont plus des, euh, disons, les chefs de projet ou les gens qui sont très près... Euh, euh, des, des travaux à, à porter. Donc, euh, au niveau académique et laboratoire, euh, qu'est-ce que euh, amènent les membres au niveau du CSUT euh, Maîtriser bah, des sujets de recherche, bien sûr, former les étudiants, c'est une de nos priorités. Euh, la mise en œuvre en commun de moyens, je reviendrai un petit peu plus tard, apporter une expertise technique sur euh, une large gamme de... Euh, de travail et euh, apporter aussi des réalisations concrètes, hein, ne pas rester tout le temps dans le, on va dire, dans le projet et l'étude de projet. Alors nos activités, euh, on travaille justement par appel à projet. Donc on a, eu, on a en ce moment trois projets dans nos SAT qui sont, euh, lab, on appelle labellisés, qui sont ATIS d'un fait spectral, je les présenterai un petit peu plus tard. Euh, la, la façon aussi de fonctionner par projet est intéressante parce qu'en fait ça permet après de gérer en fait des problèmes de consortium par projet. Donc en fait, pour chaque projet après, on, on fait une espèce de petite convention entre chacun des partenaires. Euh, les fiches de projet qu'on a, elles sont euh, à disposition de tous les établissements qui font partie euh, du CSU. Et donc, euh, B, ça permet aussi de proposer euh, un large spectre d'étudiants euh, des stages. On fait l'animation scientifique. Donc là, il n'y a pas trop longtemps, là, on, a, euh, on a collaboré une journée au Petit Tech euh, sur Toulouse, sur euh, les nanosatellites et la photonique, de façon euh, un petit peu large. Et puis, euh, à travers une école d'été, qui est en ce moment, d'ailleurs, euh, sur le campus de Super-Héros. Euh, les moyens en commun. Donc là, c'est un herbier qu'on essaie petit à petit de mettre en, 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 en marche pour essayer, premièrement, de donner toutes les spécifications techniques euh, des, des instruments ou des expériences euh, qu'ont euh, les membres du CSUT, mais aussi, et c'est un petit peu plus compliqué, euh, essayer de fixer les conditions d'accès. Hein, on n'est pas forcément prioritaire parce qu'on fait partie du CSUT. Euh, parfois, il y a le problème de... Il faut aussi euh, mais amener un petit peu la main à la pâte pour, euh, pour faire fonctionner une manip. Donc, on essaie de régler un petit peu tout ça et fixer euh, le, le bon fonctionnement en fait, euh, de ces moyens de test. Donc on retrouve donc, des choses assez standards, hein, des cubes de vie thermiques, des pots vibrants, des moyens de caractérisation, on a euh, des salles blanches, ou en tout cas une, une grosse salle blanche, euh, des chambres anéchoïdes, il n'y a pas de cube, des moyens de valider les systèmes embarqués, des plateformes de simulation, et, euh, et aussi on a de la station sol, je reviendrai un petit peu plus tard. Voilà, donc euh, je vais maintenant vous proposer présenter assez rapidement les, les trois projets en fait, euh, actuels au niveau du CSUT. Le premier, c'est ATIS, donc il nous a été euh, présenté par Thierry tout à l'heure, au niveau un petit peu plus, on va dire, euh, charge utile. Donc c'est un CubeSat 12U pour observer les aurores boréales et astrales. Donc, on l'a déjà dit, c'est une coopération avec euh, le Centre spatial universitaire de Grenoble. Euh, on a eu la revue de FASA il n'y a pas trop longtemps, une quinzaine de jours, non, la semaine dernière et euh, il est supporté par le projet Janus, donc on rentre dans la phase B, l'orbite visée euh, 650 km avec une inclinaison de 80 degrés. On espère, euh, enfin, en tout cas on vise un lancement pour la fin 2020. Euh, comment s'articulent en fait euh, les tâches entre le CSU de Toulouse et le CSU de Grenoble euh, Grenoble a la charge de la mission, hein, c'est eux aussi euh, qui développent la charge utile. Comme ils ont la charge de la mission, pour l'intérêt scientifique, ils auront aussi le centre de mission et bien sûr l'exploitation des résultats. Sur Toulouse, en fait, on est plus au niveau système, au niveau plateforme, euh, que je montrerai juste après, le centre de contrôle, euh, tout ce qui est communication, opération. Donc justement, cette plateforme. Cette plateforme, elle est issue en fait, euh, d'un pro projet interne en fait, qui s'appelle MODA, pour développer en fait une plateforme d'usu multi-session. Ça veut dire que cette plateforme n'a pas été développée pour ATIS. Mais l'idée c'est d'avoir une plateforme relativement importante pour 
mission avec euh, des, euh, disons, des altitudes euh, au niveau de, de l'orbite, des inclinaisons euh, relativement importantes aussi, par, enfin, une gamme d'inclinaisons relativement importante, euh, une charge utile euh, interne qui peut aller jusqu'à 12 kg et euh, un maximum d'énergie de 50 Wh. Sachant qu'à l'intérieur, autant la plateforme, la structure de la plateforme est tout à fait à développer, mais par contre, les éléments qui sont utilisés sont des éléments sur étagère. Euh, on espère en tout cas aussi faire de, de la réutilisation de projets actuels euh, au niveau Toulouse. Euh, juste un petit, petit plus, la structure du segment sol. Donc le centre de contrôle, je l'ai déjà dit, est sur Toulouse. Euh, alors il y, a, il, y a deux, il y a deux fréquences en fait, hein. on a des bandes S qui sont plus pour tout ce qui est euh, télécommande et récupérer les télémesures de la plateforme, donc ça on passe euh, par le réseau multimission euh, du CNES, euh, on espère aussi euh, pouvoir euh, mettre en, remettre en marche en fait une station euh, bande S en Cayenne, et après tout ce qui est euh, télémesure qui vient de la, de la charge utile, là on a besoin de plus de débit, et en fait, on passe par une, bande, par une, une station -moi, de réception bande X euh, qui est située à l'IMAC. Je passe sur le deuxième projet qui s'appelle NIMF. Alors NIMF, c'est un acronyme dont vous voyez le nom, un de satellite ou investigué de micro et photonique hardware. Quel est l'intérêt de NIMF Essayer de montrer la faisabilité en fait, d'intégrer dans les satellites des composants optoélectroniques. Euh, et essayer de quantifier ou de montrer l'impact du vieillissement, euh, enfin du rayonnement, excusez-moi, sur le vieillissement des fibres Erbium dopées utilisées dans ces, dans ces systèmes optomicro-ondes. Et c'est donc pour montrer que la technologie est utilisable dans l'espace et préparer en fait les nouvelles versions, enfin les futures versions des satellites de télécommunication où à l'intérieur, on a besoin de distribuer les horloges, donc ça peut être avec des fibres optiques, on a besoin euh, de sources à haute pureté spectrale, ça aussi, ça peut être fait avec des systèmes opto hyperfréquence ainsi de suite. Donc on reste quand même dans la communication dans le satellite. Hein, L'idée, ce n'est pas de communiquer entre le satellite et la Terre, par exemple, par voie optique, ça n'a rien à voir. Alors la mission, la mission est ambitieuse en, déjà en durée, deux ans. On veut que ce satellite qui sera dans un 3U, euh, dure 3 ans, 2 ans, pourquoi Parce qu'il faut récupérer beaucoup de radiation. Et en fonction des orbites qu'on a calculées, bon, on n'aura pas forcément celle-là, mais on s'est rendu compte qu'il fallait quand même passer beaucoup de temps, puisqu'on veut avoir à peu près au moins 20 kg d'énergie ionisante cumulée sur le satellite. Euh, C'est une coopération au niveau technique, on va dire, avec euh, Thales, Amiens Space, TAS donc sur Toulouse, euh, le CNES et le CERN, pas forcément sur la partie, euh, on va dire, satellite mission, mais aussi sur la partie composants. Hein. Il y a par exemple au CNES, il y a des gens qui ont une grosse expertise sur ces composants octomicro-ondes. Euh, il fait partie du projet de Janus. On a fini la phase A il y a 15 jours et donc on, on devrait rentrer dans la phase B pour un lancement toujours pareil visé euh, fin, fin des années 2020. Alors, comment on agence un petit peu euh, plus euh, notre charge utile par rapport à la plateforme vous voyez, c'est une plateforme 3U. Ça marche, hein, voilà. En fait, toute la partie, euh, on va dire, contrôle de la plateforme se trouve en bas dans un U. Alors, on peut dire que c'est peut-être un petit peu faible au niveau volume. Mais en fait, on a un, un, un fonctionnement relativement simple. On a choisi d'être pointé soleil. Donc, euh, ça veut dire qu'on va avoir une SCAO, mais qui est relativement simple. Hein, on n'a pas besoin d'angle extrêmement performant et euh, la mission elle-même en fait on, on ramène en fait des paramètres qui petit à petit se dégradent au cours de jour et en fait ce sont des données qui sont relativement faibles donc une simple euh, un simple débit enfin une simple communication VHF UHF suffit donc pas besoin de pointage sol au niveau radio c'est pour ça qu'on peut se permettre d'avoir euh, disons une taille relativement faible au niveau de la du contrôle de la plateforme la charge utile en fait il y en a deux vous avez la première charge utile qui s'appelle Enmon, donc qui est constituée euh, ici de deux cartes plus cette espèce de bobineau au-dessus. C'est là qu'on va, re va retrouver en fait notre fibre ou nos fibres optiques bobinées euh, sur ce torrent là et qui seront exposées aux radiations. Et on a une deuxième, euh, une deuxième charge utile qui est venue se greffer sur le projet qui s'appelle Radmon cette fois-ci, qui est une charge utile qui est 
totalement développé par le CERN et qui est là en fait pour euh, analyser l'environnement radiatif. Alors ça tombe bien puisque justement on va essayer de voir nous les radiations, qu'est-ce que ça fait sur notre système. Donc là-dessus il y a plusieurs, euh, plusieurs systèmes, hein. vous avez des rats de fête qui permettent d'avoir la, la dose cumulée de radiation, vous avez des diodes PIN qui permettent de voir ben, s'il y a une particule haute énergie qui arrive et qui fait un défaut euh, cristallin. Hein. Et vous avez aussi des, des rames qui permettent en fait de euh, détecter euh, des, des événements, alors soit, soit un événement euh, ponctuel avec un changement d'état sur un point mémoire par exemple, ou carrément le déclenchement, la chop euh, du composant. Et l'intérêt aussi c'est que cette charge utile sera calibrée et calibrée en fait au niveau du CERN. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on a au niveau euh, plateforme, donc la, la manip elle-même, bon je ne veux pas rentrer dans les détails d'options de, opto-hyper, mais en fait on a un premier laser qui est euh, euh, qui est modulé euh, par une, une fréquence. Euh, vous avez un deuxième laser qui est un laser de pompe, de, de pompe on appelle ça. On voit qu'ils sont mélangés en fait. Et là, on a trois choix possibles. Soit on passe par un chaîne qui permet de calibrer la manip, soit on passe par une. Euh, une parce que ce n'est pas évident de rencontrer en même temps. <rire> soit on passe par une, donc une fibre qui est dopée, mais euh, dont les, les caractéristiques sont communes, on va dire. Donc il euh, n'y a pas de. On peut attendre qu'il va y avoir des problèmes de radiation, ou on va essayer aussi de mettre une avec, un, avec une société qui s'appelle euh, Xlab, Xfiber, pardon, une, euh, une fribe dopée qui normalement devrait être radar. Voilà, donc tout ça, ça nous permettra avec les modules et euh, l'optoélectronique derrière d'aller faire des mesures. Il bon, faut se rendre compte que sur une table d'expérimentation au laboratoire, ça tient quasiment sur deux tables avec des éléments, des, des analyseurs de spectre optique. Des, et là, il faut tout compacter et faire toute l'électronique derrière avec une, une large gamme en fait, de mesures. Hein. Euh, tout ça compacté au niveau de deux U. Donc c'est relativement euh, complexe. On a déjà une petite carte hein, qui euh, commence à fonctionner. On, on se retrouve avec euh, les lasers, des photodiodes, un switch, là, ce switch optique, c'est... C'est une grosse question aussi ce switch, hein, il va falloir qu'il change d'état euh, tout au long de, de sa vie. Il ne faudrait pas qu'il reste bloqué quelque part, sinon euh, la mission est abortée. Et euh, une partie euh, numérique aussi, puisqu'on a en fait un, un OBC euh, dédié à la pélode, dédié à la charge utile. Pardon. Voilà, alors qui fait quoi dans, dans ce, ce, ce projet Donc on retrouve euh, des super-héros qui est plus sur la partie mission plateforme, euh, l'université qui elle s'occupe de la charge utile, Bien sûr, tout ça, c'est en interaction, hein, mais bon, on a essayé un petit peu de segmenter tout ça. On a l'IUT euh, Génie Mécanique, et elle euh, regarde et la mécanique de la plateforme, hein, on ne sait pas encore qu'est-ce qu'on prendra là-dessus, et la mécanique euh, de la charge utile. Il hein, ne faut pas que ça bouge, il faut que les fibres optiques soient bien lovées avec des, avec des, des, des rayons de courbure à, à respecter. Euh, le LAS et le CNRS, c'est donc toute la métrologie. Le CNES, j'ai déjà dit, euh, plus particulièrement l'expertise sur les composants optiques. Et l'ONERA, elle, son expertise sur la radiation. J'essaie de faire rapide. Euh, juste, un, juste pour vous dire que les étudiants, et ça c'est les étudiants de super qui ont eu la bonne idée en fait, d'essayer de, de proposer en fait, une expérience qui s'appelle MORT, euh, un système qui s'appelle REXUS, où en fait, vous avez de la place dans une fusée et vous pouvez lancer en fait, une petite expérience. Et là, ça va être le cas, euh, on va pouvoir en fait, lancer... Euh, euh, nos petits composants optiques, juste pour voir déjà euh, qu'est-ce que ça en termes de fiabilité par rapport au lancement. Donc il euh, y aura une manip qui normalement doit partir en 2018. Bon le vol, c'est pas deux ans, hein, c'est trois minutes, et on va qu'à 90 km. Mais bon, ça pourra commencer à un petit peu euh, montrer ou montrer, soulever des problèmes de fiabilité. Le projet Spectra, il est à son démarrage, donc ça va être assez rapide. Euh, ça, c'est une coopération entre le CSUT donc, et l'École nationale supérieure des techniques avancées de Bretagne. Euh, c'est pourquoi c'est un aspect surveillance, spectre radio, plus ou moins euh, orienté vers la défense, soit pour essayer de euh, détecter des interférences, soit suivre euh, des cibles pour des besoins un petit peu plus de guerre électronique euh, ou d'intelligence en communication. Alors, ce qui est fait dans un premier temps, c'est euh, ce, ce qu'on veut faire, c'est un démonstrateur d'écoute dans une bande relativement étroite, entre 400 et 470 mégas, qui soit capable d'identifier des cibles au sol, de les localiser dans un, un rayon de 50 km, et bien sûr de redescendre les spectres de l'émission euh, au niveau du sol, intégrer aussi des euh, traitements embarqués. Alors, 
le système est un petit peu plus générique parce qu'en fait l'idée c'est pas avoir un gros satellite qui écoute toute une bande de fréquences, c'est compliqué, il y a beaucoup de choses à mettre, mais c'est en faire, faire un premier CubeSat, sachant qu'il pourrait y en avoir d'autres derrière, euh, qui soit ré... enfin, pas réutilisable le CubeSat lui-même, mais l'architecture est réutilisable. Pourquoi Parce que en fait, euh, tout ce qui est numérisation, traitement, la plateforme elle-même, le segment sol, mais tout ça sont des choses qu'on peut euh, réutiliser. Et la seule chose qu'il suffit de faire si on veut changer de fréquence, c'est adapter euh, le front end RF, savoir tout ce qui est détection RF, euh, avant de, de faire la transformation en fréquence intermédiaire, et l'antenne qui est dessus. Donc on va essayer de proposer un système un petit peu générique. Vous voyez hein, quand même tout ce qui est aspect plateforme, même la petite photo là, c'est la photo d'ISAT en fait. On, est, on va essayer de faire du reuse quand même avec tout ce qui a été fait ou qui est en cours de développement en ce moment. Voilà, euh, je vais m'arrêter là-dessus. Je vous remercie de votre euh, attention. Et si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas. Merci Nicolas. Bien. Y a-t-il des questions Euh, absolument pas. On n'est pas dans les mêmes budgets et c'est pas... Euh, pour l'instant, au, au niveau, euh, on va dire, euh, là, on est pas, la plateforme n'est pas encore prête, mais si vous voulez, on est au, au niveau de l'étude, elle sait fabriquer <coughs> aussi du CSUT. Ce n'est pas, pas une plateforme industrielle qui non. est en train d'être faite, là. Le, pro, le projet, par exemple, est, euh, est 3 millions d'euros, euh, alors que Nexia, c'est 10 millions d'euros. Mais, mais l'idée, ce serait de la réutiliser, quand même, la plateforme Mona, c'est ça euh... Tout à fait, mais en, ouais. interne, en, interne, en interne, chez euh, vous, au niveau pédagogique. D'accord. En interne, on va dire, des projets pédagogiques, pas que forcément à Toulouse, puisque mmh. tu vois qu'elle est utilisée par euh, une charge utile qui vient de Grenoble. S'il y a des... S'il y a des gens qui ont des charges utiles dans le cadre du projet Janus, notamment, ça pourrait être mis à disposition. On peut faire du multiprojet aussi, si les missions sont compatibles. Par exemple, on avait l'idée, à un moment donné, sur cette plateforme, quand elle sera faite, parce qu'elle n'est pas faite, par exemple, faire des, des tests de, de propulsion, par exemple. On sent bien que dans le, le, le Nex futur, là... Il y aura de la propulsion qu'il faudra mettre sur ces CubeSat, mais un peu plus gros que des 3U. Donc c'est un, un bon vecteur, ça, pour faire des bons tests, euh, des tests de propulsion. Ça loge. 3U aussi, il peut loger, mais tu feras juste un petit test. Quoi. Enfin, il est intéressant, hein, quand même. Mais là, on peut, faire, on peut aller plus loin. Une dernière question, peut-être Merci. Bon, merci Nicolas. Donc, euh, la présentation suivante. Alors, je me trompe. Florian, c'est toi, non Oui, c'est. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Florian Marmuz. I'm doing this presentation of BL on behalf of Lilia Soloyeva, that is the new uh, stud uh, stud space, student space center manager at Ecole Polytechnique. She couldn't be here today, so I'm going to do this first presentation this morning, and I'm going to be back this afternoon for the presentation about the startup Trust Me. Um, this is a quick presentation, mostly picture based, uh, about what we did at Ecole Polytechnique uh, in the frame of the QB50 project. So what you see in this first picture, our CubeSat is in the middle, and the next one is uh, the one from the from Min. Those two CubeSat have been developed in the frame of the QB50 project with the strong help of the Janus project of CNES, and they are both flying uh, in space right now. Um, so we're lacking a couple of logos on this one. If I were to put some, would be Ecole Polytechnique and CNES. Um, so if I understood well, you had uh, Amandine Denis doing a presentation yesterday, so I may not be long on the QB50 project. Um, the idea was to do um, science with 50, uh, distribution, distributed measurement in the, in the upper thermosphere, in the lower thermosphere with 50 CubeSats. They understood in the beginning that it would be uh, an educational project, so they gave this uh, project to universities and Ecole Polytechnique was one of them. 
at Ecole Polytechnique, we have now a student space center that has been mainly built around this CubeSat project and is now developing in different directions. Um, so that's not my slide. Let me read what I wrote. Okay, nothing really interesting. Um, we have uh, Lilia, so that so should have been doing this presentation has been hired recently as a full-time engineer to manage the student space center uh, this will include um, our next cubesat project and um, different project led by students uh, some of them are doing um, for example march uh, martian space uh, space suits or working on a rocket experiment in the frame of the um, the Perseus project acne so all those students also students are doing a lot of project on the student space center is aiming at um, coordinating all of them. Talking about the um, CubeSat itself, the CubeSat B50 project has been launched in 2009. Um, a team at Ecole Polytechnic made a proposal, so a team of students. It's a uh, project that has been launched by students and that progressively gained the confidence of Ecole Polytechnic and CNES. Um, the first team of students uh, got approval from Vicky I in Belgium to start developing the CubeSat. Um, they got the help, precious help, for over six years from Gérard Ovray, which has been uh, doing the uh, holding the role of project manager. That is not cannot be here today, but um, can answer all the technical questions you may have at the end. This is a project. Uh, this is a schedule from the middle of the project. Um, this is after the first delays, and you can see that the launch was scheduled um, in mid uh, mid 2015. Um, the first schedule we had was mid-2014, so um, when they first built the project with the European Commission, they were expecting a two-year development time. So they learned a lot about how students are able, what students are able to do in two years. We have eventually uh, launched uh, earlier this year, so our CubeSat was launched from the, with 20-something others from the International Space Station. We reached the International Space Station <laughs> on April 22nd, and then we reached space in, in, um, in May 17. Um, so, as I said, um, we needed six years to, to do this CubeSat. Um, different team of students have been working in different phases around the year. And uh, until uh, now, we are still working on, the, on softwares, ground softwares for data processing and data management. Those are the human resources that have been working on the project. Uh, it included in total of 70 students from second year at Ecole Polytechnique, each student working one year to one year and a half for the most, um, um, so for the best ones, for us at least. And each one an average of six hours per week, so it's a very small uh, human resources budget, so that's a problem for this kind of uh, project. Gérard Rovray for Ramsat France was a project manager for six years. He was as well the project manager of the CubeSat from Min Paritech, so those two projects were siblings in their development. François Denis from Laboratoire of Meteorology Dynamic at Ecole Polytechnique helped as technical advisor. We had help from someone from ESA uh, for a bit more than one year as a part-time. We had to hire, and this was a strong weak point of our project, we completely underestimated the needs in terms of software development, and we had, like, we had to hire in a, um, urgently at the coming to the end of the project, a full-time software developer for nearly two years that help us do the, um, do the software. So the onboard software is something you maybe shouldn't trust uh, students to do. This is a really um, uh, student um, onboard software and attitude control are two things that are really, really technical and cannot, may, cannot really be done by students if you give them a blank paper at the beginning of the project. We had three summer interns that I could find the name again, but if you're in the room, I don't know. Um, I can't stress enough, uh, Alain Gaborio and his team helped us uh, both uh, for engineering support, uh, technical advices and uh, financial support. And Christine Nicola at Ecole Polytechnique was a strong help. She did all the budget, the financing and the purchase part. Uh, this is quite a low team, especially if you add up, uh, if you add up what a student can do. It's uh, something like 100 hours of uh, project. So what we saw from this human resources point is you, you need, um, if you want to give the project to students, which is a really good idea, you need strong uh, management and full-time people to, to support to a company because those students were working for one year, so each year you have to relearn everything with a new team and you can, you can easily lose four months a year by just relearning what the previous year has learned. 
you need at the beginning what we learned is you need at the beginning to make a project uh, a, pro a program a, a project schedule and you need to stick to it over six years you cannot let students do their own programs each year our budget um, we are we sticked around the a uh, quarter of a million of total cost funded at 50% by um, CNES and Janus. Because um, the participation from CNES was not sure at the really beginning, we made the choice to develop everything in-house. So um, what we saw is in, uh, in total we reached only 40k of material. So that's a really strong uh, asset of our project and they stress the importance of doing in-house development. Our ground station is being developed for an estimated 10k. Quick view of our design. Uh, this is quite classical uh, PCBs. We just um, chose to remove our GPS card uh, coming to the end of the project because it uh, needs a lot of power. So at the beginning we said, okay, we're just gonna switch it on from time to time. And then we realized, okay, we if it's only to switch it on from time to time, and then uh, we had the TLE from NORAD, so we don't uh, we don't really need the GPS to position ourselves. So we made the choice to remove the GPS card to make it. Uh, everything easier and actually we don't today we don't feel that we we needed it our experiment was a feedback probe measuring the the regi residual atmosphere to so the components of uh, oxygen and this was provided to us by Vicky I we had to build a bus um, to to accommodate this payload so we we built an interface board and then at the end uh, Vicky I incorporated the, the payload this is a brief overview to show. Um, so this is the number of the promotion at Ecole Polytechnique. So X2010 means, means that it was done in 2012. So you have to add plus year, two years. The project um, evolved over the years. It's a two U CubeSat. This is the final pictures we, uh, we can find. So you see, um, so obviously we had the uh, body mounted panels all around. And the top is the FIPEX probe. Uh, the solar panels have been provided by as your space, uh, in because because of a partnership with CNES, um, we did all the tests we needed to do at the platform d'intégration and the test pit at Gu in Guyancourt. So this was a um, tight schedule because we did all our tests in uh, one week, one week and a half, but that ended up well. This is a picture in the thermal vacuum facility. And here comes the nice pictures. We have been launched in space in May 20, in May 17th. So we are a bit cheating on these pictures because our CubeSat at Ecole Polytechnique was launched by night with the automatic um, launch deployer you see in the right. So those pictures at night, astronauts are sleeping, so they can't take pictures. So those are the one of um, the, poly the CubeSat from Min Paritech in the middle, but he's like really similar to us, so we show the picture. So in the middle, we can see simulating of our CubeSat that's being deployed by Nanorax. This is um, telemetry we receive. So our our ground station at Ecole Polytechnique has been moved recently, and Gérard uh, Gérard Ouvray was uh, unavailable to use it. So we we made an agreement with uh, Montpellier that is receiving our telemetries and sending it to us on a daily basis. And then we had different um, people around the Earth. Actually, this uh, this graph I think comes from. Um, this one come from Gérard, but we have some people sending us through internet from Japan, for example, hey, I read the telemetry of your CubeSat, here is what I see. So what we can see from the wall orbit data is that the battery voltage is nominal, that our solar panel temperature is moving between minus 15 and plus 25 degrees. We have been receiving this wall orbit data from one month without, without any problem. We are in a not, con not control attitude mode for now. Um, the payload is expected to be turned on this month. So we should have the first scientific results in August. The so main point of this slide is it's alive, which is a first. Our next step for the CubeSat and for uh, other projects at Ecole Polytechnique, we are going to continue monitoring this wall orbit data to, assume, to assess the, s the satellite health. So we, do not, we, we want to see how long it can last. We are doing a triple, we will do a triple ground station monitoring. So right now Montpellier is uh, receiving our data. We will uh, have uh, our ground station at X ready again uh, late this month and we built quickly uh, an emergency ground station in Nanterre at the hackerspace there that is uh, as well able to send and receive data. 
We have not incorporated in the onboard software all the data management that say Vicky I want the data in a specific format. So this hasn't been done on board. So we receive everything on ground, we process on ground, and then we upload on the on the website. Um, this is called the Deepak website that has been hacked some weeks ago. So they have had some problem too. So it's fine. Um, at Ecole Polytechnique, we are starting a new CubeSat project this year, so September 2017, as soon as the students come back from holidays. Uh, compared to this first project, um, for this first project, we had mainly Gérard Ouvray as, um, as a project manager. So Gérard is still here. We have now a full-time engineer to help this project. I will be sticking around to help the students as well. We have we have found different partnerships inside the lab. So it's an official partnership with engineers ready to help us on very specific tasks. We hope to set a new a successful partnership with CNES for our trainings for students. And we aim at a launch uh, much quicker than the first one with a three, years de three to four years development. This will be uh, hopefully, um, we'll see after the first phases, a six U CubeSat, um, may probably carrying a propulsion subsystem and some uh, scientific payloads from uh, maybe from laboratory of plasma physics at Ecole Polytechnique. So this will be, uh, we, we take the um, engineer point of view starting to develop the CubeSat and see after some months of development what size, what, uh, what can fit inside. We are not building the CubeSat around the payload, but we have starting to develop the CubeSat and see what payload we can fit inside. We have been doing some communication about this project. We, our CubeSat was presented on the CNES booth at Le Bourget. We had an article in Le Parisien. Uh, Ecole Polytechnique is doing some communication as well about us. So it's, um, it's a nice phase for us because the risks are minimal because we haven't switched on the payload yet, but we can make a lot of communication, so it's nice. And this, I think it's my last slide. Um, so our CubeSat is in space. It's working and it's a very nice feeling for a student that I wish you can all experience at one point. Um, it's in the middle. On the, on the left hand side, those are all the sponsors that help us from um, a bit of a lot. So Thales and Space gave us some money. Airbus let us use their Thermica software for free for some long months. Ecole Polytechnique, well, it's our home university. CNES gave us money and training and technical support. The Student Space Center of Ecole Polytechnique is where the students are actually working. Von Karman Institute of Amstad were leading the project. Thank you. I'm ready to answer all your questions you may have for all technical parts. I will send you to Gérard Ouvray, which can't be here today, but was really leading on the, on the scientific part. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florio. <coughs> have you any questions? Thank you for your presentation. And uh, I wouldn't ask. Uh, I would ask about the ground station software. What kind of technology did you use? And uh, is the project open source? Can we reuse it for other projects or something like that? It's not an open. So it's a UHF VHF ground station. Uh, it's not open source and uh, open source license. But if you tell ask Gerard what he how he did it, he will surely answer you nicely with all the reference of the project we can use and uh, how we did it. So it's a uh, it's on a small um, on a small building. We have a direct connection with a four meter cable or something. So it's not on the top of the Jussieu of the UPMC with long cables as here. It's um, it's much smaller. I mean, it's much closer to ground, and we can we can send you all the information we need. Yeah, you need. And for the command control also, uh, the software uh, for the command control or for the images, which was developed by student. You, well, you can see, I'm, so I work on this project, yeah, I should have said that at the beginning. I, I work on this project from 2013 to 2014, uh, then I left uh, for studies mainly and I just came back to, uh, to Ecole Polytechnique six months ago. So um, I'm not really sure about the software they use, but you know, I, I can give you a, a con so it's not contact. I can give you contact, and um, you can ask, and we can do this uh, software that's shared by um, by me on Ecole Polytechnique, and I know Gérard has been delivering on the website. So you may find it on the AppSat front website because it's, for example, if you have a ground station at home and you want to listen to our CubeSat and decode our telemetry, we provide you the software to do so. So I don't know what how much you can see inside the software, but we can discuss this later. Thank you. Just one information: uh, the telemetry decoding is provided uh, is uh, done with by uh, a Java, Java application, 
uh, written by Christophe Mercier, who is collaborating uh, as a ham radio to the project with uh, Gérard Ovray also. I'm also the ham radio, uh, former AMSAT France president, and I just uh, help them to, to record the uh, data. If you need uh, some information, I can provide. He would have some questions for you as well. <laughs> Other questions? So, thank you, Florian. We are moving on uh, the presentation of the CISU of Montpellier by André. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Andre Korev. I'm from the University of Montpellier. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organization of this workshop. Uh, for us, uh, it's the first time that uh, University of Montpellier is uh, visiting this workshop, and this time we also kind of, uh, we, because of the tight schedule, uh, we had doubts that we can manage, but managed. I'm very happy that uh, we are here from the conversations, for all the presentations that I'm hearing. Uh, but uh, because of the tight schedule, if you find uh, some typos or you see some um, uh, bloopers on, the uh, on, the, on the, my slides, uh, I apologize. Uh, so I will be presenting you uh, Space Center in general and then uh, our activities and I will, then I will going to uh, tell a little bit about our projects. I will not go too much into detail. Uh, myself, I only work, um, and mainly I would say, uh, work on uh, Robusta 3A project uh, on ADCS part. Uh, so everything else, I will uh, try to answer your questions as well as, um, as much as I can. Uh, yeah, but uh, if you have more detailed questions, maybe uh, it would be easier for me to forward it to, uh, to other um, our members. So first of all, what is uh, CSU uh, in Montpellier? Uh, we are part of University of Montpellier technological uh, platform. So uh, we have uh, two sites. Uh, main site is uh, uh, in Montpellier, in um, Campus Saint-Priest. We have a building that is called CSU, was uh, built uh, by, um, um, on the funds of the region. And uh, we also have a site in Nîmes, at Nîmes. We have uh, professors at Nîmes uh, who work with us on uh, involved in our projects, and they also do the manufacturing. Uh, so uh, about ten professors uh, participating uh, constantly in our projects, and also um, uh, some other um, researchers from uh, different laboratories, uh, from the faculties. Um, we have at CSU currently eight engineers employed. Uh, of a different level, uh, some, uh, me for example, I work like a research engineer as a postdoc, we also have uh, different engineers uh, for, for, for different purposes, uh, different levels. Uh, we uh, host uh, about uh, 30 students uh, per semester and usually um, most of them are financed by Van Allen Foundation. Uh, I will get to, to this uh, in a moment and uh, uh, we also uh, uh, participated, supported, and uh, in certain way uh, have the P uh, six PhD programs, uh, which in one way or another was uh, related to uh, one of CSU's projects, including mine, by the way, <laughs> my PhD. So uh, we have, uh, what facilities do we have? Uh, uh, first of all, the building that uh, was built, it has um, uh, like half of the floor allocated for, uh, for us. And uh, uh, we also have a clean room, which is uh, we're given us. We have uh, like a mechanic shop, uh, uh, which we can use to do the assembly and to do some tests. We also have uh, offices, of course, and we have a sil uh, uh, the whole the room for um, concurrent engineering, where we have uh, uh, specialized and uh, uh, software provided by CNES, uh, where we, uh, uh, we have a, also a separate uh, room for our interns, and this allows us to uh, host Pretty many uh, many students uh, right now. Uh, previously, we also hosted, we were hosting many students, but they were usually distributed across uh, different laboratories at EOS. Someone from one build in one building, some other people in other buildings. So we didn't have that much like team of students working in, in the same in the same place. So uh, right now, it's much better. Uh, so. Um, 
That's weird. It was not supposed to be. Oh, okay, it's uh, it's an um, um, it's uh, animation. So the um, uh, first of all, uh, I want to say. Let me just skip the animation. Uh, so uh, the f uh, in fact uh, at CSU, uh, our director um, uh, Laurent Dussault, uh, he started working with cube sets a very long time ago. Actually, he touched the first time when he worked at University of Arizona. And the first uh, time when uh, um, CSU, well, it back no, it wasn't CSU, it was uh, people from Radiac uh, uh, team at uh, laboratory US. Um, uh, they uh, participated in a nanosatellite um, project. It was in 2001 when they developed platform for sacred uh, CubeSat that was developed in the University of Arizona. Uh, so, uh, the, unfortunately, this um, satellite was lost, as was lost uh, Bauman is one, the satellite that I was, uh, was working back at the University of, of uh, Bauman University at Moscow in 2006 due to the failure of, of the rocket. But the idea, the virus of the uh, nanosatellite, it, it is unstoppable. So, uh, once um, uh, Laurent Dussault uh, came back, uh, of course, he had uh, this idea uh, of uh, building our own CubeSats and developing nanosatellite technology. So, we were very lucky to have the, uh, the opportunity to um, have this offer from, uh, from CNES to participate in development of a CubeSat and uh, uh, this is how the Robusta 1A uh, mission uh, was designed and the idea was not only build the payload but also build the platform, the satellite itself with all subsystems uh, and of course launch uh, and uh, actually do some science with the, with, uh, the satellite. Uh, I will get uh, to this project a little bit later. Uh, the idea is that um, uh, uh, since the mo uh, well, most activity of uh, the space center is related to uh, radiation environment and characterization of, co of uh, components and their, uh, the effects of radiation environment on uh, different type of components. Uh, so, uh, for in the case of Robusta 1A, it's, it, it was uh, bipolar and uh, the effects of total ionization dose. And the, more or less the same experiment uh, was made for cooperation with uh, Bauman University in Bauman It's 2. However, it was just a payload, so it was not separate. Uh, um, the complete satellite. Uh, so all those activities uh, were kind of uh, going in the background uh, because the Space Center officially started in 2011. It was established and uh, one, one of the motivation of uh, creation of this uh, Space Center is that those activities that were uh, going around, they were going in different uh, parts of our university, with different laboratories, different um, professors were conducting them. And to consolidate all the activities and to make it more efficient also to uh, provide kind of one hub for all the students that can uh, that want to work in space uh, industry um, the sp space center was created uh, so it was uh, mainly to uh, consolidate the uh, university part uh, of um, of the uh, of, of these uh, activities and uh, uh, Van Allen Foundation is also an essential part of our infrastructure and our we have a kind of symbiotic um, existence with the uh, Van Allen Foundation, uh, they attract the attention of the industry. So uh, having a Van Allen Foundation and CSU uh, together uh, allows us to work at the same time uh, on the science missions uh, to educate students and also to work with uh, the um, industry for, for different purposes, uh, both uh, making the scientific exchange and also providing for students the opportunity to uh, to do the internships to and finally to be employed uh, in the in the area. Uh, so uh, as as you know that uh, Robusta 1A, although it was uh, built completely and launched uh, uh, and it was this time launched successfully uh, on a Vega maiden flight, uh, it didn't work uh, well. Uh, it emitted a very um, weak signal, but uh, the, it was a manufacturing defect. Uh, I will get to this later. The, uh, long story short, uh, this mission was not completed, so um, uh, we worked uh, with uh, CNES, and this time in the format of uh, program Janus, uh, to build a new satellite, uh, Robusta 1B. So, kind of uh, already in the format of CSU, uh, we restarted this uh, mission. It was uh, started in 2000. And, uh, um, 13 and it was launched a couple of weeks ago on 23rd of uh, June. Um, I will uh, talk a little bit later. So, uh, as I mentioned, that we have a new building that actually we moved only very, very recently. Uh, and uh, since we already established uh, the full 
a kind of procedure of um, uh, uh, all the activities needed for satellites. Um, we started thinking about the future missions. First, of course, is to expand our uh, knowledge in missions for radiation effects. Uh, this is why we have uh, also satellite projects for booster um, uh, 1C and 1D, uh, MTQ and Celesta. And we're also thinking about um, other different applications of nanosatellites with uh, um, development of Robusta 3 um, uh, satellite and uh, potentially uh, three, a three unit uh, platform. Uh, so um, uh, overall, as I said, uh, in, uh, in, at, at CSU we have all sorts of activities and they cover most, uh, well, all the phases of, of uh, of the development and exploitation of the satellite. So we start, of course, uh, with uh, mission analysis, and uh, we, are, uh, we can say that we are real experts on mission analysis when it comes to radiation effects, because we analyze different cases, and also the, the expertise uh, of uh, RADIAC uh, team uh, cannot be overestimated. And uh, of course, we uh, also perform uh, different um, uh, modeling. And uh, after after that, we can pro we, we propose the design of a satellite. We do all the different tests, uh, not tests, uh, simulation and analysis uh, for the structure, uh, for the thermal, and we have have all the tools. And we have also specialists that can uh, do that uh, at CSU. And uh, some parts can also be outsourced to other laboratories who are helping us with that. Now, we also can do the manufacturing and assembly. Uh, manufacturing, usually, uh, we do most, uh, well, uh, most like PCBs and structure is designed completely uh, at, at, uh, at CSU. However, some parts of the assembly, sometimes it is easier to, uh, to do uh, in, with local um, enterprises. Uh, and, uh, but generally speaking, we have the whole manufacturing and assembly process under our control. Uh, so uh, we're also developing not only the platform, we, as I said, we started with developing the, um, uh, the payload and, um, uh, for, for example, a unique payload for, for both missions, um, uh, uh, Robusta uh, 1B and MT Cube. Uh, they were developed at, um, at University of Montpellier. Uh, MTQ payload was actually developed at laboratory Lyon, but uh, it, was, it was a, a tight co collaboration, of course. And uh, uh, right now we are also uh, developing um, the uh, the platform, as I said, uh, for for three Unicube sat. It means that we need to uh, take. Uh, we cannot just scale up the the one unit platform. We have to do a lot of uh, refinement. And uh, uh, one of the targeted area that right now we're exploring is to um, uh, development of ultra ultralight and uh, um, uh, solar uh, solar panel structure. And uh, we're also working on the creation of ADCS because uh, ADCS is the core part for three unit missions. And uh, we work uh, together with CNES and we acquire competences and uh, we learn how to, uh, how to apply our knowledge. And also we trying to kind of uh, uh, the, the get this, um, uh, this, the, this flow of students that they're going to uh, acquire and transfer the knowledge to, to the next generation. So um, uh, we also do all sort of uh, pre and post launch activities, so uh, as such as uh, assembly and integration and tests, and uh, we do functional tests, uh, we do environmental tests. Uh, uh, for example, right now we have the uh, possibility to do the test in our building uh, because Interspace uh, uh, moved with uh, well, it, it, it kind of region uh, found uh, uh, we, we um, bought a, a thermal vac vacuum chamber with the help of the region and uh, Interspace are operating this vacuum chamber. So if we need to perform the test, we can do it in our building. Uh, and also uh, right now after the, uh, yeah, we of course we prepare all the documentation for needed for the launch like um, the, um, uh, like the, uh, the uh, uh, loss, uh, the sea loss. And we also um, do, we have to ma manage all those uh, insurance uh, questions and, and other things. And now with the launch of uh, Booster 1B, we're also working uh, with uh, a new ground station. So uh, we also acquired uh, the, uh, the knowledge, well, uh, practical knowledge already about commissioning and satellite operation. Why am I mentioning these activities? Because um, uh, in fact, uh, all those activities are part of our projects and uh, they are um, often shared and in all our activities we of course we uh, invite students so a student has a, a possibility to choose whether he's working in development satellite or he's making tests 
uh, or he is going to be analyzing uh, the data and the work on logging, archiving, and so on and so on. Of course, we try to keep the, the best track practices and put everything in the project-based uh, uh, kind of framework. We're using uh, project management software. We try to uh, follow the, the standards like ECSS. We follow also the, um, the Janus uh, um, roadmap that and uh, documentation provided uh, by CNES. Uh, so, um, and, uh, well, uh, uh, now I will uh, briefly talk about uh, projects. So, uh, Robusta 1B, I already uh, said the, the, the reason. Uh, I think that uh, we only need to mention that uh, it was, uh, well, um, so, the, the, yeah, the challenge uh, of the Robusta 1B. So, uh, since we have already developed the, the payload, we knew how the experiment works. Uh, we know about uh, the CubeSat, how to build the assemble. The idea was to discover what didn't make it work, so we needed to make it work. And uh, the approach that we used is to introduce the uh, quality assurance uh, policies, uh, because the problem was manufacturing, but at the same time, those kind of problems are supposed to be discovered on the test stages. So we discovered that, in fact, the approach, the testability of the satellite was not optimal. So we required the, uh, uh, the remaking and refining the design of the satellite in such a way so we could test all the functionality and make sure that it is going to work and charge the batteries. And this is uh, and the, the success of Robusta 1B mission is, uh, uh, shows that uh, we actually succeeded in that. Uh, so, um, and right now the status of the project it was uh, launched, I will probably, um, maybe I will skip the, the video because I guess uh, I'm, I'm a little bit restricted on time, uh, but the, um, the idea is that uh, we launched, we, um, uh, we know that the platform is fully operational, it was uh, clear from the very beginning, uh, we didn't have any troubles with that, uh, we switched uh, once we uh, had the, the first signals and the good elevation angle in our ground station, we switched uh, on intermission mode. And right now we're already collecting the, um, the scientific data. Uh, of course, we needed to do some tuning and to understand how better uh, collect the data, what exactly the period of integration uh, and uh, all, the, all the small tuning. But uh, generally speaking, we're already receiving, uh, receiving uh, the, um, the useful data for the science. Uh, we also can say that, uh, confirm that the ground station that we are using is, is operational. Of course, we received data from um, um, XCubeSat, but we didn't send any commands, so we didn't know exactly how it's going to work uh, for, for uplink. And it works, it works uh, very well. And uh, in fact, uh, yesterday I received a message that uh, since, uh, uh, I think this afternoon, yeah, it, it said uh, this afternoon, the ground station is going to work in automatic mode, which means that we analyzed all the uh, anomalies that we had uh, for, uh, starting from the, from the launch, and we found the, the problems, and now we can uh, basically relax and uh, receive and analyze the data. And data analysis, of course, uh, um, uh, is, is done by Red Jack Group. So uh, I say the full commissioning expected in mid-July because uh, we have a platform that uh, already commissioned, the payload uh, is something that we're doing, but uh, it's something that is going to be uh, very uh, very soon. And the ground station, uh, we can say that right now it is commissioned. So maybe we're going to be even earlier than mid-July. So uh, another another uh, CubeSat project is MTCube, and it is with a partnership with ESA. And uh, the idea is still the radiation environment. However, the main challenge of this pro project uh, is it's not the same payload. It, it's not the same idea. It's not the, uh, the bipolar components. It's uh, memories, and it's not a total ionization dose. It's uh, single events. Uh, so for this case, we need to know that we can actually collect uh, good scientific data. And of course, the challenge was to find how to, on which orbit and in which conditions we need to run our experiments. Uh, this is why a lot of ground testing was done by, um, in the, in the, as, as a part of a PhD. Actually, yesterday it was defended. Uh, so, and also one of the things is that uh, with, with memories we need to know exactly where, where the error happened because, and try to map it on the, on the uh, layout of, of the memory. So, uh, it requires a lot of information, to downloading a lot of information, which Robusta 1B wasn't making. So it led to development of third version of the uh, uh, one unit platform. And this uh, uh, one unit platform was also uh, proposed for our next mission is Celeste mission. Um, uh, in this case, we do not develop our hardware, uh, sorry, we develop our hardware, we, we do not develop the payload. The payload is fully developed in, uh, at, um, um, at, at CERN. And uh, in fact, the challenge for us is that we need to uh, integrate this payload in our, in our structure. So it's something new. We, well, 
for, for, so far it goes well, but uh, it's a little bit different, uh, different activity because we need to exchange the documentation in a very specific format, so we are learning something new every time. And uh, uh, the idea of this uh, mission is to, uh, to, to, to use basically the same uh, radiation monitor sensors that are used in charm facilities at CERN. And uh, to, uh, but of course it ha they have to be managers. Actually, you can see the, the sensors uh, here on this slide and uh, you see all, already the card developed with miniaturized sensor on the next slide. Uh, and um, uh, recently we participated in, in uh, um, Fly Your Satellite program uh, for, and uh, we were selected and uh, it means that we are going to be provided the uh, launch and uh, I guess test, test campaign as well. Uh, but also means that we have to keep our schedule very, <laughs> uh, we, we have to uh, maintain our schedule right now. So uh, just to summarize, so we have one unit uh, platform that we're using right now for Celeste and MT Cube. And uh, in fact, if uh, you have an idea of any experience that we can carry out, uh, in fact, we have uh, already something pre-made. Uh, pre, um, pre so uh, in a very short uh, period of time, we can uh, integrate your payload uh, or think of an interesting mission in a collaboration. So um, then I will, I will say a little bit about the future. Uh, I will not go into detail of, of this uh, mission because itself it deserves like 50 minutes or maybe 40 minutes presentation. I will only just say that uh, University of Montpellier uh, and uh, CSU were specializing in radiation environment. However, this is not only uh, the only focus uh, in our work. We try to explore different other possibilities, different mission concepts. Uh, and in this case, we, we have chosen a telecommunication as a new uh, kind of adventure. And of course, for this, we need to, uh, well, the, the main idea of the mission is to collect the scientific data at sea and then transfer them very short, in a very short period of time uh, into the Meteor of France to do the prediction and especially prediction of uh, extreme weather conditions such uh, we have in Montpellier during um, um, uh, uh, autumn and in, in spring, well, it's, uh, so the idea is that uh, this system contains, uh, in this case, it's not just a simple satellite, it's a system, and system will contain uh, the flight segment, which is a satellite, but it also has a sensors based at sea and uh, at, uh, on the ground. And of course, the Mitchell Control Center will also have a very important role of collecting all the data, analyze, analyzing, and uh, kind of streaming the data to the, to the end user. So yeah, it's generally speaking the, the structure of the of the uh, of the project and uh, me, as I said, I'm uh, mostly working on the ADCS part. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I think I've said this already. And uh, yeah, in fact, uh, what I also wanted to mention is that it is uh, very important this kind of uh, new missions. If we embark a new mission, is to to understand that this is an iterative pro a process. We think that this mission is feasible with this those kind of components of this type of approach. Then we do the detailed design, and we see that we have a new restrictions we didn't take into account. And so you have to be prepared. Uh, we, sh we we now prepare ourselves that, and we learn that this is iterative. Uh, process so uh, so if something we can carry out from what we're doing right now is that you should be also prepared to this uh, yeah that's uh, basically what I uh, what I have um, I don't know if I, I do have any any more time because uh, um, no not at all sorry so thank you first for this presentation Do you need questions? Yeah, time for one quick no? question. Time to lunch. One quick question, maybe before. Okay, time for lunch. Thank you, Andre. I, I was uh, wondering if you, uh, in fact, uh, uh, when we launched the Robusta 1B satellite, uh, the first data that we received, it was uh, received in uh, Bauman University because the second pass was over Bauman University. So right now, actually, I have audio files from the first signal that we received from Robusta. Did you want to hear it? So it's very short. So 
was transmitting Morse code on the first passes, and uh, if you de decipher the code, uh, you can read the identifier for boost. This is how we identified on the second pass already. But the <laughs> This is what we receive right now, and it contains already interesting data. So that's uh, that's more or less what I wanted to present. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much.